Well, good morning and welcome. If you would, open your Bibles again to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to continue our study verse by verse through the book of 1 John. And uh, last week we wound up in verses 15 through 17 of chapter 2, where it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Okay, so it's interesting that we talked last week about not loving the world, and then we pick up this week in, um, in, chap- or in verse 18. Verse 18, it starts out, it says, Dear children, dear children, what's he talking about? He's, he's talking about uh, believers, about uh, followers of Jesus Christ, and he's saying, dear children, and, you know, some of you may still be, you know, kind of tied onto that world train and uh, your wagon's hitched to the world. You need to reach up and need to pull that hitch pin out and get off that train this morning. And he's, he says, dear children, believers or followers of Christ. And he says, this is the last hour, the last hour. What's he talking about when he's talking about the last hour? I think he's referring to the last days. Now, Remember, this was written 2,000 years ago. How could he call that the last hour or the last days? Well, let's remember that time is split into four different categories or four different specific periods. We can go the the time from Adam to the flood. The time before the flood is one period of time. The uh, the time from the flood to Jesus, the time of the Old Testament, um, time when God sent his son to the earth, We, we typically refer to it as B.C. I like to think of it as before Christ, you know. And uh, that was a time period. Then from the time of Jesus until his second coming is often referred to in the Bible as the last days. We're in those last days. In fact, I think we are in the last minutes of the last days. And then there's coming another time, a thousand years, when Jesus will come back and he'll reign for a thousand years here on this earth at a time when Satan and his demons are, are um, locked in chains in Hades. And then the Bible teaches that he'll be, Satan will be released for a short period of time, and then will come the final judgment, and all souls of men will spend eternity either in heaven or in hell. But the time we refer to right now is ta- called the last days in Scripture. So he goes on. Let's read just a little bit more. He says, as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Now, what's he talking about? He's talking about Antichrist. Well, if you've got your notes there, the definition of Antichrist merely means against Christ. It's like the opposite of Christ. Anyone who denies that Jesus is the Son of God is Antichrist. Now, Antichrist is referred to as different things. Uh, He's referred to the lawless one, as the Apostle Paul says. Revelation refers to him as the beast. Daniel calls him a king. The only place where we find the word Antichrist in the Bible is actually in John here. Now, the Antichrist will be a person. He'll be a world leader in the last days. He'll have these amazing skills that will unite the world into this global government system. He'll make a peace treaty with Israel, and he'll break it after three and a half years. And uh, he'll be a very anti-God. He will set himself up to be God. But you know, in order for the Antichrist to rule, to control the world, there has to be a system in place. Um, There has to be uh, this way for him to do that. So I've been thinking a lot about that in the last several months, and it Back in November, when we were in Florida, uh, on our way home, Goldie and I made a little detour, and we took a little detour into Georgia, and I want to talk to you about that a little bit this morning, then we'll move on into the rest of these verses. Uh, But I've been trying to wrap my mind around how the globalists think of this um, world system. You know, what makes them tick? You know, my first recollection of this is way back when George H.W. Bush was president, and he talked about this new world order. And uh, many of the presidents have talked about this new world order and this new system that's, that's coming along. 
And so my research led me to this little obscure place out in the middle of nowhere in Georgia. It's called the Georgia Guidestones. Now, this is a picture I took of the George, Georgia Guidestones. Let me give you a little bit of history. In 1979, a stranger came to this little town in Georgia, and he bought five acres of property from a farmer. This man's name was R.C. Christian. And then he went to a local, uh, local granite quarry, which we saw several of those as we were driving through the countryside. There's these huge quarries in that area where they quarry granite from the, from the ground. He commissioned a quarry to make these big stones. Each one weighs 42,000 pounds out of granite. And he commissioned them to what to put on them and everything and, and where to place them and everything. And uh, in 1980, they went out there in this five-acre patch of a cow pasture, and they put up these guide stones, they call them. And after he was finished, Mr. Christian deeded the land to Elbert County, and he disappeared, never to be heard from again. And it was later discovered that he was using an assumed name, and nobody really knows who he was or what happened to him. But somewhere, there was a group of people that... Uh, spent about $500,000, half a million dollars, putting these things up out there in the middle of nowhere. Inscribed on these is 10 guiding principles in eight different modern languages and four ancient languages are on the capstone up there. The modern languages are, of course, English and there's Chinese, there's Russian, there's Arabic and Hebrew. I forget the rest of them, but but uh, each side, there's four stones there, and each side has, has um, these ten in a certain language. And uh, the guiding principles. It's, it's out in the middle of nowhere. There's a little parking lot there where we could barely get the motor home in there, barely enough room to pull in there. And it's just a rock parking lot. And uh, I could walk out and take some pictures of this place. It's kind of on a hill. And, uh, but off a country road out in the middle of nowhere. But I want to talk a little bit about what's on these stones, because I think it sheds some light about this globalist system that the Antichrist will use um, when he comes, all right? So let me just go through each one, um, this list. The first one, the very first one is, says, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Sounds like a great idea, right? Until you realize that today there's almost 8 billion people in our world today. So what happens to the rest of us? Um, I don't know. Maybe they put up these guide stones. You know, they're granite because if you want something to last, you know, a few days, you put it in wood. If you want it to last, you know, longer time, you put it in limestone. If you want it to last for centuries, you engrave it into granite. And this is granite. So they plan to this to be there for a long period of time. Maybe there'll be some great calamity that happens to, to mankind. Maybe that's what they're planning for or whatever. But, uh, but something happens for them to reach their goal of the other seven and a half billion people. Um, so, of course, if that's your thinking, then, hey... Planned Parenthood's a great idea. I mean, let's keep population as low as possible. Uh, let's do that through abortion. Maybe it's, um, you know, unleashing a virus that kills old people and sick people. Maybe, maybe that's part of the plan. I don't know. Um, but what would God say about that? Well, we know when Noah came out of the ark, God told Noah to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Nowhere in the Bible do we hear about, uh, about God saying, let's limit population. Nowhere do we hear that. Um, funny story, my grandfather had 19 kids. And uh, it's true, he had 19 children. So the story goes that someone asked him one time, uh, why'd you have so many children? He says, well, you know, God told Noah, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And, and the guy says... Yeah, but he didn't tell one man to do it all. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> so that's the first principle. Maintain humanity under 500 million. Uh, the second one is guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Um, so again, so Planned Parenthood fall right into their agenda. Man choosing who deserves to live or die. Uh, but I thought that was God's job and not ours. Um, the third one is unite humanity with a living new language. Sounds good. I mean, I'd, I'd like that if everybody would speak the same language, right? Wouldn't you? Uh, if it's English, because <laughs> I speak English, <laughs> right? But remember the last time that happened was at the Tower of Babel. And what did God do? God confused their languages so they couldn't talk to each other, so they would scatter all over the world and replenish the earth. I don't think it's up for man to decide that. Uh, the fourth one, rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Now, anytime they talk about reason, it, it leaves God out of the picture. It leaves God and faith out of the picture. Reason is about what you can reason in your mind, what you can think about, what you can reason out in your mind, what makes sense, right? Um, you know, I believe that Jesus came to earth as a son of God, born of a virgin, that he grew up and he died on Calvary. He rose again three days later and he's coming back again. I, I, I can't prove that. It takes faith to believe that. But if you're ruled by reason, then you can't believe that, okay? Okay doesn't leave room for faith. Um, how about this one? Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Sounds good, but who decides what are fair laws? When we take God out of the equation, then we have only man's ideas left. And based on the previous principles, it would not be a stretch for this group to decide that anyone who disagrees with them should be executed. Um, just this past week, I've seen some, some lawmakers who've suggested that, you know, those, those who support a Trump should be re-educated, that our children should be re-educated, you know, put in, re you know, that never turns out well. <laughs> some of us remember the Soviet Union, we remember Cuba, we remember the re-education camps. Okay. Um, okay, how about number six? Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Sounds good, even reasonable, although we have seen the world's attempt at doing that through the United Nations. Um, when you put officials from countries like Saudi Arabia on the Human Rights Council, uh, it doesn't turn out very well. I mean, in Saudi Arabia, women can't even drive a car until just recently, I believe, they started letting women drive cars. I mean, it, it, it's, again, it's man's rules, not, not God's rules. Uh, avoid petty laws and useless officials. That, that's one I would really agree with. But again, who decides? Who decides? How about this one? Pa balance personal rights with social duties. Uh, sounds good until you study history. This is, this is veiled socialism. And we've seen in the past where socialism has never worked. When we try balancing social justice with personal rights, social justice always takes over. And that's the pro proponent of the Great Reset and uh, things like that that we've talked about in the past. How about number nine? Prize truth, beauty, love, Seeking harmony with the infinite. Sounds good, but where does truth come from? Now, my Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Truth comes from God. It comes from God's word. When you take that out of the equation, then, then whatever, whatever you decide is truth can be, can be truth for you. If you decide that there's 52 genders, then there's 52 genders. Um, whatever your truth, you decide for truth to be. And number 10, it says, be not a cancer on the earth, leave room for nature, leave room for nature. I think in number 10, we can see the very core of the problem with this kind of thinking. Romans 1, as Paul is outlining the downward spiral of man mankind, he says, 
They worship the creation instead of the creator. And that's what this is all about. It's worshiping the creation instead of the creator. It's a worship of nature. It breeds some disguide, misguided policies like, and I've been involved in the, in the lumber industry, so I know a little bit about this, but um, about not allowing loggers to go in and, and log where there's, you know, a spotted owl or some kind of a, a species because, you know, we might kill their habitat. So we let the trees grow up and die. The trees that God put there for us to use, we let them grow up and die and fall down and create all this debris. And then we have this huge fire that destroys millions of acres and destroys our habitat anyway. But it's that worship of nature at all costs that puts things out of kilter. So those are their 10 core beliefs of the globalists. Um, I have a suggestion. How about we just go back to the Ten Commandments and we start there? Let's do that. Let's do that. I think that would be better. Now, tomorrow begins the 2021 meeting of the World Economic Forum. Um, They're doing it virtually this year, of course. They meet every year in Davos, Switzerland. And it's 2,000 leaders from around the world, whether they're presidents or leaders of global corporations. They get together and they... They plan for greater cooperation in this one world government. This one world government. You can go to their website, World Economic Forum. You can read all about it. Sounds great, grand, and wonderful. Um, one of the things that they're really promoting this year is this new, uh, new common pass, they call it. It's a system they're starting to implement worldwide. So you can certify that you have had a negative COVID test before you get on an airplane. You get a negative test, and then um, you download the information to your phone. It, pr- it uh, produces a QR code that you scan as you go through uh, TSA at the airport, and uh, sounds all grand and wonderful. I want you to notice what it says on their website. It says, without the ability to trust COVID-19 tests and eventually vaccine records across international borders, many countries will feel compelled to retain full travel bans and mandatory quarantines for as long as the pandemic persists. Now, I want to be clear, this is not the mark of the beast from Revelation 13, but I believe it's setting the framework for that that is coming very soon. So the Antichrist is coming. He may be here now. I don't know. I don't know who he is. But that's not what we need to be worried about this morning. Something far more dangerous is here today. And that's the many antichrists. I want you to notice the rest of the verse. He says, even now, many antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. This was John speaking 2,000 years ago. He says, many antichrists are already here. Now, what's he mean by that? Well, see, within every person, there is this spirit. We have this spirit. What you see outside of man is not, not really who you are. It's just your body. It's just your flesh, okay? But within all of us, there is this spirit. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? Paul refers to our bodies as a temple and a tent, a temple of a spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.4, For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up to life. So we're spirits living within temporal bodies or tents. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a spirit. Okay. And then we go to 1 John 4, verse 3. It says, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Very similar to the verse we just read. So every person who's not a believer in Jesus Christ, we could say is an antichrist. Turn to your neighbor and say, I hope you're not an antichrist. (laughs) 
Okay, let's go on and read the next verse. Verse 19. It's talking about these antichrists. He said, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. My second point this morning is antichrists cause disruptions in the church. Disruptions in the church. So how do they do that? The first thing is they do it by leaving the church. By leaving the church. It says they went out from us. Apparently they had the same problem we have today. People would come to church for a while and then they just wouldn't show up anymore. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes we wonder what happened. What happened to so-and-so? We're, we're, sometimes they find another church and, and I get that, another church that better suits their needs. I understand not every church is for everybody and I get that. And that's fine. Um, sometimes they leave the church because they're not really believers. It says here they were not of us. They weren't, they weren't really here. You know, non-believers can only stand a Bible-believing church for so long. Either they become believers and change their lives, or they find some excuse to leave the church. <laughs> you know, and I've heard them all. I've heard them all. Usually the reason people give is hardly ever the real reason. You know, the music was too loud, or the church is always asking for money, or I didn't like the pastor. Or, now, that's probably a real reason. I understand that. <laughs> or sister so-and-so looked at me cross-eyed, or whatever. Find an excuse and stick to it. It's fine. So the first thing, the disruptions, is just by leaving the church. Uh, how about by denying the faith? Let's look at verse 22. It says, Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. It says, Those who deny Jesus is the Son of God, or deny that Jesus is the only way to heaven, are denying the faith. You know, that's a big problem in our day. Um, People are afraid to stand up and say that Jesus is the only way to heaven. It's the only way to God. They're afraid of being called intolerant or being um, called not politically correct or whatever it is. The enemy is trying every possible method to try and get us to deny that Jesus is the Son of God. Trying to get us to deny that Jesus is the only exclusive way to God. They're telling us we need to be tolerant, you know, we need to get along. And, um, and at the same time, those who are telling us that are very intolerant of what we, be, what we believe when we say that Jesus is the only way. And unfortunately, I believe that's gaining some momentum, gaining some momentum. That's Antichrist. That's the Antichrist spirit which is Satan himself. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. People say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I don't really believe that. <laughs> well, if you don't believe what Jesus said, you don't really believe in Jesus. Okay? Uh, the third way is by compromising the truth. By compromising the truth. You know, nowhere is this more prevalent today than on the issue of gay marriage. Most mainline denominations have accepted gay marriage, even though God's word is very clear on the subject. I want to share with you a couple of verses from the New Testament. I'm not even going to go to the Old Testament because they always come back and say, well, that was the Old Testament. That was the old law. We don't follow that anymore. I mean, the old law says you shouldn't eat shellfish and you shouldn't eat pork, but you do that. So this doesn't apply either. Well, let's see what the New Testament has to say in Romans 1.27. It says, in the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty of their error. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be, be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. Of course, the great comeback is, yeah, but... Jesus said to love everybody, right? Yes, he did. But that's a great misunderstanding of the word love. The word Jesus uses 
is the word agape. It's the kind of love that God has for everyone. It's the kind of love that we are commanded to have for everyone. The agape love, when Jesus said, to love your neighbor as yourself and to love your enemies, it was agape love. It had nothing to do with sexuality whatsoever. Um, it's that kind of love. That's a different Greek word, which would be eros. And they say, well, don't judge. Well, Jesus said, by their fruits, you shall know them. Now, I want to be clear. If you are here or watching online this morning and you struggle with, with that, uh, I want you to know that God loves you. I want you to know that we love you. I want you to know that, that it's, that sin is no different than someone who struggles with unfaithfulness to their spouse, adultery. It's no different. But God tells us we have to repent from that. It's very clear in the, in the Word. See, just because the government has passed laws that say it's all right, doesn't make it right. We answer to a higher law than the government. We answer to God's law. Don't believe the lie that God made you that way. That's what's being taught to your kids today. That's what's being taught on the television, has been for years. That God made you that way. No, he didn't. God made you special. God made male and female. And don't forget that. A lot of confusion, a lot of confusion, which brings us to the next one. By causing confusion, by causing confusion. Matthew 24, 24 says, For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. Jesus is talking about the last days. He's saying there's going to be a lot of confusion in the last days. There's going to be a lot of false teaching in the last days. And Unfortunately, a lot of that is being done in our churches in these last days. False teaching on that issue and many other issues. Colossians 2 says this, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. A lot of confusion. See, many have been confused when the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of the gospel is muddied up by some strange teaching, some tradition or some other strange teaching. It's so simple. Believe in Jesus Christ. Repent from your sin. And you'll have eternal life. It's so simple. But here's my third thing this morning. True believers won't be fooled. Here's the good news. True believers won't be fooled. Verse 20 says, but you. I love those words, but you. He's talking about all these things. He says, but you're different. <laughs> you're different, but you. You're different. You have something non-believers don't have. That word but is a key turning point. It lets us know something different is coming up. That word is used a lot of times in the Bible. In fact, it's used 3,000 times. 983 times. We could say God is the God of God, but, but God, but God. This thing is happening, and it was terrible, but God showed up and everything changed, like this verse in Acts 13. It says, when they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb, talking about Jesus Christ. It says, but God, but God raised him from the dead. He says, but you, but you, what does he say? You have an anointing from the Holy One, and all you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. But you, believers, will not be fooled. A, why? Because we are anointed by the Holy Spirit. We're anointed by the Holy Spirit. It says that in verse 20. It says it again in verse 27. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. You know, there are many people who believe in God. They say, uh, believe in a higher power. Believe in there's a super, supernatural being that created the universe. They, 
They would reject evolution as nonsense, believe in creation. Um, they would not call themselves atheists. They not, might even believe, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they do not have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Why is that? You know, let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's see where this anointing comes from. If we go back to the Old Testament in Leviticus, it says he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. This was Moses pouring some anointing. He was consecrating him. Why, why was that? For the service in the, in the tabernacle, right? And then we go to the New Testament. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. The Bible says we are now priests. We are now priests of God. We're anointed by the Holy Spirit when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior. Revelation 1.16 says, And has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. You receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit when you become a believer in Jesus Christ. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. Because you're a priest. Turn to your neighbor and say, Hello, priest. All right. Because we receive the anointing. We, see that we have the Holy Spirit within us to guide us. Here's the next thing. Because we are grounded in truth. He says, all of you know the truth in verse 20. It's so important to know the truth. How do you learn the truth? You study the word. You read the word. You study the word. You hear the word. Um, how do you recognize something that's false? You study what is true. How do you recognize counterfeit money? You know what real money looks like, and you recognize real money. And when false money comes along, immediately you will recognize it. Now, he's not advocating that we don't need to learn and grow. He, he says in verse 27, says, you don't need anyone to teach you because the Holy Spirit will teach you. He will teach you. He will guide you, and uh, so forth. And, that, and the last one, C, because we remain faithful. Verse 24 and 25 says, As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. That's a very important word. Remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. Remaining in him, and he will promise promises that you will have eternal life. This morning, don't be an antichrist, all right? I hope we don't have any antichrists here. I hope you all have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And as I said, it's very, very simple. Believing in Jesus Christ, staying in his word, knowing the truth, so when deceptions come along, you will recognize them right away. I want to wrap up with a little, a little story. Beware of terrorists in the church. We could say beware of antichrist in the church. This is beware of terrorist groups in church. Latest news reports are that five terrorist cell groups have been operating in many of our churches. They have been identified as been sleeping, been arguing, been fighting, been complaining, and been missing. Their leader, Lucifer Ben Workin, trained these groups to destroy the body of Christ. The plan is to come into the church disguised as Christians and to work within the church to discourage, disrupt, and destroy. However, there have been reports of a sixth group, a tiny cell known by the name Ben Praying. It's the only effective counterterrorism force in the church. Unlike other terrorist cells, the Ben Praying team does not blend in with whoever and whatever comes along. Ben Praying does whatever is needed to uplift and encourage the body of Christ. We have noticed that the Ben Praying cell group has different char characteristics than the others. They have been watching, been waiting, been fasting, and been longing for their master, Jesus Christ, to return. Let's be part of that Ben Praying group. Which brings me to how I want to wrap up this morning. In your in your bulletins, you've got an insert in there about our life groups. 
And uh, I want to ask the life group leaders to come forward this morning. And uh, some of them are old, been doing it for a long time. We've got some new groups that are starting up. So I've asked them to come up and just talk briefly. I mean briefly. Did you hear me? Briefly? A minute or so about your group, about what you're studying, where you're meeting, and so forth. And so people can put a face to the name. We've got some new people who may not know who you are. And so you all can come up and just kind of line up up front here, all right? All the, all the group leaders. <clears throat> 